Look at all of Thomas's videos. How to lose belly fat, this way to lose belly fat, exercise to reduce belly fat. I get it. I have a lot of videos on reducing abdominal and visceral fat. So does the rest of you too. This one's different. This is how to not gain belly fat. Because some of us maybe don't have an issue with losing it. We just don't want to gain any more of it, right? Like, like, okay, how do I specifically not gain fat here? Well, there's some interesting data that we can look at on ways to sort of attenuate fat accumulation that are really interesting. There's one particular study where they added a thousand calories to people's diets for eight weeks, a thousand calories a day. They added just a surplus to see like what things limited the accumulation of fat. We're gonna break all those down because they're really interesting. And after today's video, I did put a link down below for one of my sponsors, Timeline Nutrition. There are a lot of longevity experts and fat loss experts that have been talking about urolithin A, which is a compound that is in pomegranates. Really unique stuff because it's a compound that helps your mitochondria go through what's called mitophagy. So it induces sort of these metabolic mitochondrial changes to make your mitochondria stronger and more resilient, which could have impacts on performance, definitely, but definitely has some impacts on metabolic health and potentially even longevity in that respect. So that link down below is a 10% off discount link. I've worked directly with them. They're an interesting Swiss company, and I've worked on helping them formulate new things. I've worked on, anyway, I know them inside and out, and I can tell you it's a good product, and it's one that I personally recommend and use. So that link is down below in the top line of the description. Okay, so that study I was talking about, that 1,000 calorie study, here's what's super wild about this one. This was a 1999 study. This isn't anything super flabbergastingly new, it's just wicked cool. 1999 published in Science. And what they did is they, they took subjects and they said, okay, for eight weeks, we're gonna give you 1,000 calories above your maintenance levels and you're gonna gain some fat. But we're gonna also watch like your lifestyle and who gains the most fat and who doesn't. What they found right out the gate is that two thirds of the energy that was expended came from non-exercise activity thermogenesis. And in 1999, they didn't really even know that NEAT non-exercise activity thermogenesis was as big of a thing as it is. So in this world, when it comes down to especially fat accumulation, we have an energy surplus or energy toxicity, like abundance too much energy, and that affects how our body uses fuel. If we have too much energy, the body doesn't really know what to do with specific fuels, so it might allow extra glucose to do something, it might allow extra fat to do something, and eventually leads to deposition or fat accumulation not what we want. And in those that are more genetically predisposed, it goes to belly fat. Those of us that are more metabolically damaged definitely will go to belly fat or even visceral fat. Okay, so what we found in this study is that two thirds of the energy that are expended was non-exercise activity thermogenesis. Only like a fraction was actually activity, like exercise. That is the best news for people that don't wanna exercise formally. And candidly, I know it doesn't look like it by looking at me, but I don't like going to the gym. I prefer to train in my own ecosystem, in my own gym, by myself, with my own music, with my dogs and my kids, and it's just how I am. I don't like going to the gym. Sometimes you have to force me to do that. That being said, people think exercise is how we burn calories. Or they think that just our BMR, our basal metabolic rate, like what we're like sort of pre-programmed to burn, or the thermic effect of food. Those are all, those things were slivers, slivers, slivers. Our BMR is a different situation, like our metabolic rate. Most of the calories we burn came from non-exercise activity thermogenesis. And in this study, two thirds of it was non-exercise activity thermogenesis, but here's the kicker. The changes in non-exercise activity thermogenesis accounted for the tenfold difference in those that gained fat and those that didn't. Those that had more non-exercise activity thermogenesis, there was a tenfold difference with how much fat they accumulated, and they were in the same exact surplus. And it was free living, but they were able to look at a lot of data. And interesting things happen when you add more calories in. Okay, you are not living in a isolated chamber. You are not living in what is called a bomb calorimeter. Calories matter immensely. Probably the most important thing that we know of. But they're not probably the cause of a lot of things. They are the indirect cause of things. But you're not in an isolated chamber. What that means is you are a very dynamic and fluid machine. So when you increase calories, you're not a rock that's suddenly adding mass, okay? You are a moving being, which means as people added more calories in, 
a lot of them said, oh, I need to move more, or they didn't even know it. They started fidgeting more. It happens with me. It happens with lean people a lot. Oh, wait a minute. Did we just kind of solve something? You never notice that lean people are always like chewing their gum, and they're like moving around, they're fidgeting. Those kinds of people are usually pretty lean, right? Something's really lean. But there's a wide spectrum in between that that we may not always notice. We may not always notice that the guy that's 4% body fat is chewing his gum like a maniac and tapping his finger and driving you nuts. But we don't notice the person that's 15% body fat, relatively lean, that just fluidly moves more than the person that's 30% body fat, right? So there's sort of these changes that occur in our non-exercise activity thermogenesis. But when you increase calories, a lot of times it just makes you wanna move more. I am someone that intermittent fasts a lot, but one of the beef that I have with intermittent fasting is that when I downgrade my caloric intake, I actually decrease my non-exercise activity thermogenesis. I don't move as much. This study made it quite clear that when they added more calories in, a lot of these people started to just fidget more and move more. And they measured their non-exercise activity thermogenesis and they were the ones that had the tenfold difference in how much fat they accumulated. Now what we're starting to see, and based on some other literature, is that exercise is good for inducing a change in adaptation. For the longest time, we have looked at exercise as our way of burning calories. You are setting yourself up for failure if that is how you burn calories. What you wanna do is exercise to induce a change and an adaptation in your body, and you want your daily life to burn calories. So don't even look at how many calories you burn in an exercise session unless it's a metric for you for performance or for you know, some value. I don't want you to go to the gym and say, I burned 300 calories. Your body doesn't care, I don't care, you shouldn't care. What you should look at is, how active was I today? How many steps did I have? More so, was I active or was I completely sedentary? You will burn more fat, but you most importantly will not store as much fat. If we put you in a 1,000 calorie surplus, but you focused on moving more, you would utilize those calories more. What does this look like? How could I paint a picture for what might be perfect for you? Well, if you have a desk job, get up and walk every 30 minutes for two minutes. Get up every 60 minutes and walk for five minutes. You can take a break, especially when you know that your productivity is gonna go up. Don't get inside your own head. I have worked in the corporate environment, in the bullpen, cold calling, where I have a boss breathing down my neck. And I know that if I were to get up every 30 minutes for two minutes, they would probably look at me funny. But if I got up every two minutes, or if I got up every 30 minutes for two minutes, but I delivered, they wouldn't breathe a word. Some micromanagers would, and I'm not saying this is the case with everyone, but I do know, even with my own staff, my own employees, I don't care if they get up. I want them to be their best self. You will be your best self, I promise you that. Your exercise needs to be fun, and it needs to be intense, but it can be short. You're not trying to be an elite level athlete. I did a video called The Thoroughbred Versus The Mule, and the mule ends up winning. The thoroughbred is the one that has to race, the thoroughbred is the one that has to train, but then they just keep that thoroughbred locked down so that nothing touches it and damages it. Okay, it's a little like, it's just pampered, but it rests a lot. 99% of us are not elite athletes especially when you look at how many people are actually lean and under 8% body fat, it's a ridiculously low number. Those people are different. Athletes can push it hard and then recover. If you're going to the gym and you're just trying to stay healthy, you don't need to recover like an athlete. You should focus on the opposite. Athletes focus on their training as their life and the rest just recovery. You need to focus on your life being training and your exercise just being a shot in the arm dose to make you stronger. As always, keep it locked in here on my channel. I'll see you tomorrow.